This is the 20th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guy Batteries, Pro, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk bass fishing. Second day in a row back in studio after a month on the road. 22 consecutive days. Now, I did throw a couple of largemouth bass fishing days in there. I was like with Jody White at some secret lakes up in his neck of the woods, but primarily smallmouth. And, uh, and now we get a whole month coming up with both the BPT and the Elite Series uh, and some Toyota Series of watching the guys, uh, watching the guys who are the best in the world at it catch it. It's going to be a very interesting uh, Angler of the Year race with uh, Champlain and St. Lawrence left on the Elite Series schedule. Justin Hamner uh, looking to become, I think, one of only two other anglers. I think KVD and then uh, Mark Davis, I believe, in 95. Well, today's guest would know. I uh, just stood up. But today's guest would definitely know of Mark Davis. I think he won the Angler of the Year and the Bassmaster Classic in the same season. And he might have done it out of a bass cap boat. Was that 1995, Rick Pierce? 95, won the Classic and Angler of the Year. Um, he was the only one to do so in the same season, which means you qualified for the classic and got the anger of the year in that same season coming off that anger of the year and won the classic. And then the next one to do that in that method was Kevin Van Dam. They give the credit to a couple others, but their AOI season was the year after they won the classic. So they didn't qualify for the classic. Right. And then win. They they qualified for the classic, won the classic, then won the Angler of the Year in the next season, which qualified them for the following classic. And so, yeah. so Mark Davis the, won like Angler of the Year in like July or something like that, and then won the classic in like August. Yeah, yeah, and he had three AOYs in that period of time for us. He was really Mark was a really good competitor, and that's part of that story. You know, he lost a tremendous amount of weight. To, yep. Um, in ninety four and five. And um, he uh, went in and won that one in North Carolina on a fat free shed the year he lost all the weight. And uh, Mark Davis is a good friend of mine. We've stayed friends for decades since he was about 18 years old. And he's a wonderful guy, man, just a really solid Christian man. Um, Tilly's a wonderful person. They've got good kids, you know, really proud of James, how he's come along, Hunter and Fisher. Fisher fishes, Hunter doesn't, you know, kind of those things. <laughs> Does Hunter hunt? That's the key question, right? Yeah, I, mean, I don't really know if he hunts that much. I think mean, he hunts, I'll put it that way, but not, he's not all just wound up in it like some are, you know? Yeah. So you've known Mark since he was 18? Yeah, we met Mark through friends. We had a, a boy down in um, a Mount Ida that pushed for him when he was young. He lived in Hot Springs right over by McClard's Barbecue behind the outdoor store down there and uh, right off the corner going out toward Royal. And uh, his, his dad lived down there. His dad was a drywall contractor. And Mark went back and forth to Lake Hamilton all the time. And so basically um, known him for a long time and Jim Owens connected us. Jim Owens is one of the two oldest owners of a bass cap boat and uh, had an early 1971 model. Uh, Jim Byler holds the distinction of having the oldest one. Jim lives right here, and he's in his 80s now, and he has a Lynx in his garage. So Jim's got a, a new uh, Pantera Classic in his garage. But those guys have had bass cap boats. It's the only boat they've owned since 1971. Now, that was back in the day when even though Mark, so when he won that Classic in 95, that was when they had to fish out of the Rangers, even though he was a bass cat guy, right? Yeah, that was interesting. Um, so, yeah, they had to fish out of Rangers. They ran Evan Rude Motors in that day. Um, you know, Rangers had a lock on this market, as you know, until the late 90s. Matt, yeah, there he is. 
<laughs> There's the fat free shad. Every That's once in a while, it comes that together. I did not know good. we were going here either. This was not in the pre pre show meeting, but there's there's the cat hat, the cat jersey, the fat free shad, and citrus right there. And I think if I hit play, yeah, Bill while you gave talk, him, he had the Bill Dance had the rights on that signature, and they gave uh, Bill make, allowed them to put Mark's name on the other side, and we did these big stand up. Um, cardboard, which we couldn't get cardboard then because it's way expensive. So you had to build like 2,000 cardboard pieces. You know, graphic work's come a long way since the 90s. But uh, we, when Mark won that, we did these big stand-up cardboard pieces and put them in the corners of dealers. We didn't set them on. We actually did them on plexiglass. They were expensive, and we got falcon rod tips off John Beckwith and put falcon rods on them, you know. So he's holding the falcon rod when he walk in the dealership showroom. And we had those all across the country. And Bill Wilson, we sent one down to Pradco for Bill. And they put it in the conference room or the break room there. And there's Mark. You walk in the break room, there's Mark. One night about midnight, he was working late. Went in, turned the light on, and there stood Mark. <laughs> 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 and just spilled his coffee, spilled everything, and made a mess of the break room. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, stuff, man. So, back in the day, did that did that bug you that you know right down the road? There's Mark winning the classic out of out of uh, Forest Boat wearing your hat. I don't think it bugged us. We know it was a different thing, you know. And, and yeah. that, that mantra carried on. Um, Irwin carried that mantra, and of course, it was all Forest Nina and what those guys did they had a tremendous lock on this market nobody knew covers and magazines page locations and that carried on into flw matt after that yep. so flw followed that same pattern and you we couldn't even take an advertisement out in their publication uh, hmm. cast magazine under operation bass operated that way when mike whitaker had it and i like mike i've known mike since the 70s when I, met him as a kid but uh you know no disrespect to mike and all but it was just kind of their mantra ranger locked us down and a lot of the promotion and ability they had through those days was because they had such a lock on the market through Bassmaster and then flw so it, it was really the chosen the chosen boat because nobody else could get ink cover space you name it now what were you i remember you telling mark one time jeffries that winning that mark davis did not let me see if i what did, do you remember saying this that mark davis didn't sell any bass cats by winning tournaments out of them but that he was the best a good ambassador for bass cat like outside of the 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 results in the tournament that that gave him the platform to then do you remember am i around in the ballpark yeah, on this many Rick? times when, when mark won the classic and we we had rail breckenridge in 73 and rail had signed an agreement um when he won the classic soon after he had to live up to the agreement and that was toronto ranger boat because that was if you won a classic ray scott became your agent in those days believe it or not um and so mark had to sign I mean, not Mark, but Rail had to sign, and he went over. And in La Rail's later years, he put a post up about starting his career and winning the classic out of basket, running a basket boat. But uh, the year after that, uh, Tommy Martin was running our product, and Tommy uh, won the classic running the basket boat. When they went to the classic, um, they tried to get him to sign a contract. Tommy didn't sign the contract. Okay. And so there was a rather interesting, sticky situation. We'll leave off air. But <laughs> I think the statute of limitations is passed, Rick. Yeah, well, it's passed, but I'm probably not going to do that out of respect to Tommy because Tommy remains to be a very good friend of mine, I feel. And I've known Tommy since I was a kid again. So, and, and I think Tommy, where he's at in his age, still moves almost like he did when he was 30. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's qu quick at everything he does. Tommy takes no time to do anything and does it all. But uh, just out of respect to Tommy, we'll leave that one off. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair but uh no doubt uh the the that changed in 74 and then people started being able to not have raised their agent so to speak and so um that followed through mark won that on a fat free shed and i've always said this this is what you're talking about 
that um, it sold a lot of fat-free shad for Bradco. I couldn't even begin to think how many fat beef free shad yeah. Bradco sold because of that. I do not believe, and I cannot say that Mark winning the class sold one bass cat boat. So I'll say the same thing about a guy named Chris Lane when he won it for a small company called Legend that was in business at the time. I don't think Chris sold anything by winning the classic. But, you know, what we had with Mark Davis was much deeper than that. Going back to his time in the 80s as a young man and starting his career with us was he was very popular in Montgomery County and right down there at Garland County, but really Montgomery County when he moved down to Mount Ida, gotten out of Mountain Harbor for Bill Barnes, and Bill's a great guy. But um, you look at what Mark did, and I think he sold more bass cat boats than I can count because he was Mark Davis, and that's what I said. Yeah. So okay, we have a between, for, for 30 years now, the what we call a BTA, boating trade area, but the BTA numbers out of Montgomery County, uh, Matt, we sell between 50 and 100 percent of boats sold in Montgomery County. And where is and where exactly is Montgomery County? Mount Ida, Arkansas. Wow. So they That's don't great. sell a lot of boats in Mount Ida, mm -hmm. but when they do sell one, it's, it's probably one of ours. <laughs> is so is is he still running a? Uh, I last couple years ago, I I crawled around his Jaguar. Did he, is he still running the Jag? He went to, um, back, he went to Puma STS last year. Okay. That's what I thought. And, uh, Paul did not. Paul stayed Jaguar. I think Paul may have run Jag three years now, for Paul. Elias. Yeah. I got a cool thing on Paul we'll talk about in a minute. But, uh, Mark's run that Jag again. He just loved the boat. Yeah. He likes the layout, he likes wet fishes. He likes the size, and it's his tournament boat. He said it, it, he doesn't have to have the speed anymore because they got that 30-minute limitation on performance. But basically, he just likes the boat. What's your, uh, <laughs> what's your Elias story? I got a cool thing on Paul. Yeah, you want to shift, okay? Um, yeah. I mean, are we unless I, I have no idea where we're going with this. Well, but we'll look I'm, it up. You can look it up. I, I'm curious. I'll, I'll hold that one, but yeah. Um, though, um, Paul is this weekend getting inducted into the Mississippi sports hall of fame with a pretty elite class. Oh, that's cool. And so he's going to be in Pearl, Mississippi. I'm supposed to go Saturday. I've got some things that have come up. I probably will not be able to make it. I was, I called Shaw. Of course, Shaw's a good friend of all of ours. And Shaw told me at ICAST, he probably couldn't make it. We were trying to get Gary down there and have a nice table set up with all of us. But uh, it looks like it's probably not coming together, so we're going to figure that out. But real big honor for Paul. He's getting into the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame with a pretty unique Hall of Fame class. I'm sure you're digging that up right now. I got it right now. you got the inductees right there. Walter the Red of, Barber. There's a list of inductees somewhere. Yep. Paul Elias is literally right next to Eli Manning. <laughs> That's a pretty elite <laughs> class. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Smith. Savante Stringfellow, Becky Vest, Jimmy Webb. Yeah, they've got a a, a banner shot of all of them somewhere. Yeah, right you pulled there. up a news feed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a pretty elite class. I'm really proud for Paul. Um, Paul's been a friend for years and years and years. We're really glad to have him on our staff. Um, we've got a real elite former classic winter staff you know that mm -hmm. we got everybody from an eye canale to a takahedro and others and it's uh it's really a good staff and they're really quality guys and and we talked about mark of course so we got scott suggs who's a flw cup champion and um, first million dollar winner yeah first million dollar winner at his age i believe yeah uh, that was the was that at washita Oh, you mean the first – oh, no, Scott Suggs won the first million-dollar winner. It was at Washar Hamilton. I can't remember. Yep. It was at one of those two. I remember he won on the brush piles, and they gave him a damn million-dollar check, and we were all like, holy cow, that's a million dollars. Yeah, Scott set himself up well. Good family people. Wife's a good person. You know, they're just solid. Lost his dad a few years ago. Hated to see that. Um, Suggs has been a friend of mine going back to the 80s. 
Uh, we talk about that all the time. He ran a boat for another competitor back in those days, but he's always been a good friend. So we're glad to have Scott. It's kind of nice. This is kind of unique for me because I grew up fishing in Arkansas. I knew a lot of these guys. And, yeah. Um, you know, I was one of those claimed anglers in the third when I was 30 some years old. But um, that goes by you when you do other things, you know, you focus on what you need to and I focus on career. So, um, you look at those guys we grew up, we were all friends, we traveled together, traveled around each other, saw each other at events, um, did some really neat events with them. And it's really good to look at people like Paul and Mark and all these people we've got that have come to us and we've tried to help out and their staff and they're just great guys, you know. Yeah, I'm trying to find that of the forest. Yeah, there it is. It, I think it was, uh, no, that was, it wasn't 15. That was way, way before that. That was just some highlights of Suggs jumping up and down and holding that million dollar check. <laughs> yeah. So you got, I think you guys had Elias join in what, 2017, 2018? Uh, yeah, it was probably 16 or 17. Was that I'm the first there. time that he, so he wasn't with the uh, cat in the early days or he was? No, he was with, uh, you know, and you'll back look at these guys' careers. Um, just got, Paul started with the Corbin Dyer and Bass Hawk. Wait, wait, wait. I've never even heard of that. Corbin Dyer had a little company down there out of Georgia called Bass Hawk. H-A-W-K? Yeah, Bass Hawk. Corbin Dyer, okay. D-Y-E-E-R, I believe. Yeah, these are all things people don't know. You know, back in the 80s, in that period of time, that you and I have talked about that being the heyday of our market. At one point in time, we had who knows how many competitors. I mean, I can sit here and tell you it was over 70. At one time. Holy smoke. And so they were just boats on top of boats. Every we called them chicken house builders, you know, because they'd start really literally in chicken houses and take an old chicken house, strip it out, start building boats in it, you know. Yep. Okay. I found Batisti's website of all of them. He's going to have it. So I went to yeah, the Bass Batiste, Archives. That's a wonderful website. If somebody doesn't know about the Bass Fishing Archive, um, really want to give props to Terry and Pete and everybody that's given credit on that site. They do a really good job. That's a really cool picture, you know, the one you just had up. That's a, a good friend of mine that passed away. That's the first 1500B on Lake Millwood, by the way. But the other one, the other ad you got there, that's a really treasured picture of mine because it's one of the only shots that I've got of my friend Steve Eastwald in a boat with me, and we left the drain plug in that boat. So that boat has Wait, the drain Wait, that's you? Plug. Yeah, it's me in the front, Steve on the back deck. Wait, wait a second. That's you right there? Yeah, that's a 78 model year deal, man. That's one of the things when your friends want, friends, your kids want to know what you look like when you're a pup, you know. Holy high thigh shorts there, Rick. Uh, that's kind of sad, then. You can see Eastwalds. So you pulled, yeah, you pulled the drain plug and then just let her sit. No, that actually has a drain plug in it. Okay. And we pulled the drain plug and we couldn't get enough water in the boat to show the picture. So we took their two-inch pump and dabs up on the roof above it. John Eastwall, Steve's dad, is shaking his head. That shot at Bull Shoals Marina at the old gas pumps. Okay. And dad's on the roof with a two-inch pump pumping that boat full of water and taking the picture from on the roof. And you can see I got the trolling motor down. Yeah. And we actually used the trolling motor with the water over the batteries. <laughs> wow. That's an old silver troll trolling motor. Cool stuff, man. Yeah. So then anyway, right below that is out of Olive Hill, Kentucky, the Bass Hawk. Mm-hmm. Outside it, it, there it is right there. Yeah. And that's the one you were talking about. So that's what yeah, they started Elias as a, um, yeah, they started actually as a kit boat. What is that? You would buy the parts and assemble them yourself. Wait, 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 wait. I'm I'm not following, Rick. <laughs> you would buy a hull, buy a deck. You bought all the parts. You bought a kit, just like okay. buying a kit car, and you bought a kit boat. And basically, you bought a boat. You bought all the parts came to you. you so you could buy whatever out, parts you, you wanted. I load them all up. So they would have a hull, and you would put it together yourself. Basically, you put everything together yourself. Oh, I would never make it to the water, Rick. A lot of people did, and most of those kit boats didn't get done. <laughs> I would never, I would, even, I would never even come close to getting that thing. It was the one boat I remember starting as a kit boat. 
Look at this. There was a little company over here lure lock. at Yellville that was going to take that mantra named Holiday, took a Hydrosport copy, and they were going to do that. So I've never even heard of, I've heard, I've not heard of Duracraft either. And that's another Arkansas boat company. Yeah, there's all kinds of them. You look at them. Which one's that above it? That's like you've the got cobra? one above it. That's a, that's a different cobra. That's what I was going to say. Everybody talks about cobras. That's a different cobra. Yep. So, you know, we just got all these old companies that used to be in the business that people don't remember. You know, Rick Klein's starting in a glass drawn. Yep. I'd heard of that. El Eldo Eldo Craft. Craft. That was a pretty cool bull boat. Yeah. Boy, I didn't realize all of these. Uh, the Fish Hunter out of St. Louis. Uh, Elder Craft was, you know, you go up, there's a roughneck ad there. <clears throat> That Freddie Lewis roughneck. Huh. Freddie Lewis, Freddie Jr., I think he's still down smack over Arkansas. They were in the electrical contracting business. Freddie's my age. So I, if anybody hears that, Freddie Jr., there's his dad's boat there years ago, roughneck. It was, this was not when Freddie had it, but he'd had it started it down there. Uh, you've been doing this forever, Rick. When would you say the heyday of bass boats was like that 85. you would say 85. 85 what made it what Smoking, made that baby what made that the heyday of the bass boat we came out of the oil recession and everything was just booming so we had oil going into the 80s and we were behind on product matt as a company you know dad wouldn't change he had listened to some other people and he and I we sat down in 82 and we had a conversation with each other in 82. And <clears throat> during 1982, we built 32 bass boats. And so we had a conversation with each other and I did a business podcast the other day and I talked about working a lot of hard nights and 81, 82, we, we were just crushed and the old recession had gotten us. It was very hit in Texas, saving as a loan scandal, all those, um, Right across Ray Bob and, and uh, the lake air going into Dallas, all those complexes that are apartment complexes and stuff going yep. in across from Bass Pro down there in North Louisville. Dallas. No, not Louisville side on the other one. Um, Ray Hubbard. Okay. On Hubbard there, they had all those complexes. You see all those big complexes there. A friend of mine tried to buy those post savings and loan scandal. They were tied up in an estate. They'd finished like four of those buildings and that entire property, that entire property around the point, I cannot remember how many acres it was. And he wanted us all to partner up and risk the rest of our life. And uh, I, I did not, he didn't either because he needed too many helpers. It wouldn't, but we could have bought that ground for $126,000. Wow. I mean, that's multimillion property now. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Bass Pro goes in across the highway from it. So you, you know, it's it's multi-million dollar property now and and that was just crazy because the savings loan companies in texas had got hammered so the 82 era was tough on everyone but our product wasn't where it needed to be it needed to move and we needed to step in 82 dad and i had a conversation about we can't keep doing this we got to change and change we did and we started moving in a different direction and really you know i call it if you've ever read the book simon Sinek, it starts with why i think that's when we really found our why and so that's a different conversation. I wasn't going down that path, but usually we no, take a path right. we weren't on, you know. So anyway, we changed things and it cranked, cranked off in 82. And we started the Pantera Pro in 84 model year, fall of 83. We uh, moved on with that and things just kept cranking. them. we went into 1991 after the Pantera 2 and the Sabre. And my gosh, that was probably the busiest time in our era. 90 was a recession and we were running three and a half, four boats a day out the store. Wow. That's a lot of boats, right? Yeah, it was a lot of boats in for us. And it was a lot of boats when the market was upside down. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to time that with the Puma STS the same way, to be real honest. Because a really innovative boat. You've got one now, you know, yep. you're clipping along. And no doubt we were trying to time that going into a downturn. And uh, the little COVID bubble kind of got us on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting time. 
So it, it, it affected our plan there. We couldn't have planned that and didn't have to think about the amount of money America was going to save. American savings went up five times during COVID. Uh, Alan, I see your comment, and I'm going to refer you to the last time Rick was on, which was on location at the Bass Cat Owners Tournament. We did a 20 to 30 minute segment on colors and metal fleck and why they are what they are. He said, metal fleck paint, why has everyone but Bass Boats left that in the 1980s? And you did an entire half show on the trends and the colors and how it came about and why it was. So you can just Google that on, uh, on the BTL YouTube channel and watch that. And Rick goes far into depth as to why bass boats look the way they do and why they look the way they did and why we like, uh, we like our glitter even in 2024. Hey, the, the, the ski boat companies had to grab it, man. They had to have the glitter. Yeah. Uh, so all the wakeboard companies are doing it now. So, so you said eight? Yeah. So eighty five. Eighty five was really the peak of this market, and we were talking about that. That's a. I think the economy had a lot to do with it. We came out of the recession and oil economy. Things started got back to a normal economy. The mm-hmm. government propped up all the savings loans and institutions, um, and it, they needed to. I'm not saying that was bad. You know, America's got debt. Every country's got debt. We got it, too. Um, you know, everybody forgets we ended the Revolutionary War with $75 million in debt. So it's not going to change. Um, sure, we need to slow it down. It's been exponential. But on top of that, that economy went strong, and it'll continue to go strong. And and um, 85 was just where people had working class could afford a product. We didn't load them up as much. Uh, single axle trailers, no brakes, you know, all the requirements weren't there. The EPA laws weren't in, so we had lower cost products to build with. Um, Quality products didn't exist like they are today. You bought glass was American made. You didn't have Chinese made. You know, the generation ahead of me and my generation, we're the ones shipped all this stuff overseas. So that's created an entire different conversation. Mm -hmm. But in the 80s, most everything we bought was American made. So one of the things I noticed, Rick, is looking at those pictures is like there's certain I've never actually gone into how this works and feel free to go as deep as this as you want. But how do you determine what motor goes on the back of the boats? Because I've seen Hondas, Suzuki's, Mercury's. uh, I've seen. Yamaha's I've seen everything on the back but then you see other brands where it's like either just a Yamaha or just a Mercury so just as a whole just talk about pairing up the motor with the boat over the years and how yeah fair question is that a fair question yeah Johnny kind of cranked that one up a little in the 80s when he signed his Mercury Marine deal and everybody will remember in 85, if they look back in an 85 Mercury, you know it's a one-year motor because it's got a brown decal. And Mercury made all the decals brown that year to match, match bass trackers because that was their largest customer at the time. So they did a deal, and it was all brown decals. It wasn't public, but it was well-known. That's why they did it because the color of a tracker in those days was that brown orange type combo on an aluminum boat. Um, Johnny started that buying trend with Mercury and then that? that's it, baby. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Continue. That's interesting. And so that was his trend. He wanted to buy direct <clears throat> and his goal of course was to offer for less and continue to compete. You know, he started by, most people don't know this. He actually bought his first boats off the Fisher Marine and Walter Stubby out of Mississippi. Walter Stubby was former president of Bass Research Foundation in 75, 6, 7, and 8. And that was an old organization to save the black bass. You know, they've had Blast Bass Unlimited. You've had a lot of organizations. But Bass Research Foundation was the original, we're going to save the black bass foundation. We're going to save the bass, you know. So, um, it, and definitely Walter was in front of that. They took a trip every year with all the members. So they'd go to 
They went to the Cayman Islands. They went all kinds of places. And uh, eventually Walter left Fisher Marine and went out with BRF and it didn't fare well for him. And Johnny at that time was buying those boats off of Walter, who was vice president of uh, Fisher Marine. He eventually bought Fisher Marine and started building his own boats. And so that kind of is the story on Tracker. Um, he can probably elaborate on that more than I can because he was there, did it, you know? But that started the outboard motor trend when he started building them on his own trackers. Start building trackers, starting to put motors on them. And so as you look at what they did then, and you go in behind that, everybody wanted to do something with the motor companies, they thought. And in the old days, we all had state reps. Everybody had a Mercury rep, a Mariner rep, a Johnson rep, an Evanrude rep. And they all called on everybody's accounts and dealers, and they had service reps. There were hundreds of service reps and sales reps. Um, that eventually got ate up in the 90s when Irwin got the deal. Well, actually, probably 80s when Irwin got the deal to buy Johnson Avenue outboards. And Irwin Jacobs had a lot of power because what he did was he had bought shares in Outboard Marine Corporation. And as I understand it, and obviously I wasn't there, one day he got a call from the chairman of the board of Outmore Marine Corporation. They would not sell him engines for Cajun or his boat lines. And so what he did one day is they called Irwin. At the time, I believe he had 7% of shares, my understanding. And he had to own 9% of share to get a board seat. If he had a board seat, then he could control the sale outboard engines. He would wind up buying them. So since they wouldn't sell him the outboard engines, he was buying his way in to own them. Yeah, that's Irwin. That's Irwin. And uh, Irwin, uh, they got a call one day and said, Mr. Jacobs, just how many motors do you need to not buy more shares of stock? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first of the trend that eventually started in the 90s that really hard to buy outboard motors from a company. And we were a bonded warehouse for Mercury in 96 and 97. So what that meant was the motors on our property belonged to Mercury. Okay. And we liked that system. Actually, we tried the last, we were the last ones to fold over to buy an engine direct because we wanted the dealer to control the transom. That's where your question goes, man. Okay. And so we wanted the dealer to control the transom and we still want the customer to control the transom. So that's our method here. Um, yes, no doubt we're Mercury strong. We've always been Mercury strong. Our dealers are Mercury strong. Um, that's not saying anything. I'll give you an interesting story on that in a minute. But uh, those outboard motors back here in the box, we would mount them, send the serial number to a consultant Mercury to an individual in the office. And she would, Lisa would take those engines and build those out. Lisa Galski would build those out. And uh, he, he, she would bill them out to the dealer. So we actually didn't invoice them. We just mounted them and installed them and held them for them. Okay. In 98, that ended. They ended the bonded warehouse program. We had to buy them direct. And as that happened, I'll lead into a segue. I had a conversation with Charlie Ingram's um, Ben Blue and his son-in-law. At yep, Fishing University. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, Ben and I had a conversation. We were talking about that. So we were buying the engines and in, in that period era of time, you'll remember Procraft was bought by Mercury. Procraft and Astro, which had Cheetah in the 70s. There were three lines there. They were owned by Jack White. And I told my crew here about a month ago about Jack White and how much he built and how Procrafts were 30, 40 a day. They were just shipping oh, wow. folks like they were popcorn. They weren't a lot of money. And they did a really good job in the 70s to promote the brand. But uh, they'd had their financial issues over time. He sold out to Johnny and Tracker Marine, I mean, eventually. But at the time, he had sold out to Brunswick. And Brunswick uh, had it, and they didn't go so well for them in the, in the early 90s. And so that's the reason they built. They had engineers design the hulls. They didn't run. They'd run 46 mile an hour with a 150. We're fishing bass. Uh, the Japanese were running one that was just pitiful. I mean, some of them they built a 17 foot Astro for Klein back when we were running the Caracals, it would run that Astro fat, fast 17 would run, but uh, it wouldn't run quite with us. But it ran really good, but didn't was nothing to it, you know, it was lightweight, mm -hmm. short hull. It's really a 15 foot hull with motor on back, and so 14 and a half really. <laughs> they were small for the big, big pontoons on the back, big sponsons, but uh that era right there jack white 
eventually wound up buying the company back from Mercury when things didn't go so well because they went from those tubs, from those boats to the tubs. And they were engineer designed boats that didn't really, they just designed boats and graphically and they were bathtubs. They didn't run too hot. And so Roy Ridgel, a good friend of mine, got with the guys in the prop department and they built the very first high five. And that was five blade prop was developed for that Procraft line. Well, Jack eventually got the company back when it wasn't doing so well. They came in, sold it to him. They gave him a one year agreement to sell the engines to him because they're selling them internal. Okay. Company to company. He got a one year agreement to buy those motors from uh, Mercury Marine at that price. Well, in Jack's mind, yeah, I'll next year I'll resign the agreement, right? Well, that was a part of his payoff. Mercury's a publicly traded company. They can't do anything for Jack they don't do for us. So they can do that to say, okay, we're selling this, and this is a part of the sale price. But they can't do it after that. And so the SEC would have difficult tra- challenges with that, and they would find them in, con- in, uh, in violation of trade law, you know. And so uh, that next year, Jack went to renew the agreement, and Jack had to buy engines the same price of all of us. Well, it put him upside down on the company. He could no longer do what he did under the price structure because the engines were costing him tremendously more money. And so he wound up uh, selling it to Johnny and Bass Pro. And I didn't, he hadn't heard that story told by anyone. And Charlie and Ben stopped me for about 20 minutes at ICAST. We had probably one of the longer conversations I had at ICAST because everybody was on the run. And uh, Ben asked me, he said, I met a guy at my boat repair shop. And he said, uh, the guy sitting on a bucket over here with a bottle of oxygen, I just want to know if he was real. The guy at my boat repair shop used to work for him. And I just want to know if he was real. He said, do you know a guy that used to build a boat called a Procraft? I said, yeah. He said, he used to build 30 boats plus a day. I said, he did. Really? I said, yeah, Ben couldn't believe we built that built that many boats in that time, you know, because you don't today. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, he was really, he said he was sitting on a bucket with a bottle of oxygen. I said, I hadn't heard that Jack White's even still alive. <laughs> wow. But apparently he is. And he says, oh, yeah, he comes in there about once or twice a week, hangs out. So I don't know where you're at, Jack, but that's a good one to hear. Yeah, it is. So anyway, yeah, that that started the whole boat engine buying trend, though. And so now what happens is, is you've got the White River Group tied up to Mercury. You've got Yamaha owned Skeeter. Um, You've got 100 percent agreements with Yamaha, which is what they make. They make a 90 to 100 percent agreement. Their trade law says they got to have a 90, but they'll push for 100, you know. So uh, Mercury does the same thing in reverse order. And that's why all your White River Group stuff comes with Mercury. Um, we do have an agreement with Mercury, but we're not locked where we can't sell Yamaha. We like Yamaha. I mean, interesting story. I told you, I'd tell you back years ago, my guy at Yamaha that actually set us up at Yamaha was a guy named Arna Irwin. And on Yamaha was pretty predictive of how they wanted you to run. They would just say, this is the way we're going to do it. Okay. I wouldn't do that. That, you know, that's pretty much something I did. And so that's didn't really care if they were here or not. So I just turned around one day and Arna showed up at the door. He said, we got a lot of dealers selling Yamaha motors. He said, we'd sure like it if we could mount your, those motors on your boats. And I said, well, here's the stipulations, Arna. This is what we're going to do and how we'll do it. He said, that's the only way you're going to do it. And I said, yes. He called me in about two days and said, okay, we're going to do it. So that's how Arna got us in here from Yamaha. And he was our DSM or regional sales manager for Yamaha on the OE side. And he came back a few years later and went to work for Mercury as our ISM out of Mercury. And of course, when you're in Yamaha, you're asking us for more market share. And I told him the customers predict our market share. And then he walked in with his Mercury and he said, for owner's tournament was his first year. We're in front of the Ramadi Inn. He pulls up under the awning. I shake his hand. He said, we're talking. He says, I got a question. He said, you know, I'm here now. He said, how do we get this Mercury share to go up? I said, Arnett, it's the same question you got on the Yamaha side. The customer dictates that. So that's yeah, the way we run it. Based on yeah. what they want. And then, yeah, uh, obviously, want. Skeeter Yamaha, like, it's Skeeter's, like, owned by Yamaha. So that's, yeah, like, a, that's why thing. you see so many Skeeter Yamahas. Yeah, interesting thing during CARB in California because the Yamaha didn't have a three-star engine. 
so they had to mount skeeters in California and made an agreement with Mercury to sell skeeters in California. Hmm. Well, everything's people, connect everything's connected. Some degree, yeah. It's like, it's like instead of six degrees. Mercury's right. probably controlling a lot of those part sales now at OMC. I don't know how much, but it's like two degrees of separation in the boat in the boat business. Like uh, it's the boat build. Like everything is no, you know what I mean. It fe- it seems like everyone like knows everybody has something to do with something. I mean, you kind of just gave a little bit of history going back fifty years. Yeah, you know, everybody does know somebody to some degree. And Earl, of course, Earl's a good friend of mine. I like Earl a lot. Um, I know Klaus. Klaus grew up forty miles up the road. You know. Mm-hmm. So I've known Klaus when we were both greenhorns trying to make it to fishing. You know. And uh, Gary's had a good path of what he's done. Teresa does a great job there. She's wonderful. Um, good company. They're doing a good job. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, there's some changes in the market at Skeeter. You know, Jeff doesn't run anymore. New guy under him tutelage. And we have the same thing going on here. I've got a new crew running this show now. And um, I'm in Earl, and we were sitting here about an hour and a half yesterday saying, I, I don't know if that's a good idea, guys. <laughs> I did. I had a. I had a. Uh, had a little photo shoot with the new uh, Puma that just dropped on the uh, Bass Cat social medias, which I thought was, uh, which I thought was cool. I did like a walk around, and I didn't realize that I knew so many of the little things about it until he's like, "Well, talk about the things you like about it." And I was like, "I was pretty proud of myself. I was able to rattle off like a dozen things." The first one I did. Rick, it was like uh, it was like seven minutes long, and he's like, "Hey, like we're shooting for like a minute here." <laughs> and I was like, "All right, oh, you did oh. the sixty second version, right?" I gave him the sixty second. Now, what I didn't put in there, it's like one was, of our podcast, Matt, we're at forty three minutes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I just screwed. It is what it is. Let me know when you have to when you have to bounce. I'm good uh, today. I kind of set this aside. Like I told you, I had a pusher on an afternoon shot on a video call, but yeah, we we're good. So what I didn't what I didn't highlight on the, uh, on that new Puma, I guess it's not new, uh, new to me, the STS. Cause I got like, I think one of the last 24s cause it would, it had been like a eight months in production. Anyway, long story short, I'm on Champlain. I come out of, uh, I come out of Mallets Bay on day one and it's ripping. I'm not good at Cardinal directions. Ripping it's ripping three, four, South, South yeah. at like 22. And I have to go to the Champlain Marina. And it's like, I have to go with them for an extended period of time. And I got up on top. Anyway, long story short, I completely submarined it, Rick. I heard that yesterday. Somebody told me you did that yesterday. I filled it up. Like, could not. I ripped, you know, the little side plates on the uh, uh, Ultrex, the little plastic side plates that I ripped both of those, like, peeled them off the side, the whole nine yards. Dude, that thing drained in like less than a minute. Now, it stayed in the hole yeah. for another three minutes, but I was shocked because I've been in a couple boats where I've speared them, and it usually takes three, four, or five minutes where you're like, eh, I'm ready for this to start draining. Dude, that water was gone out of that entire boat. That's why like, we did the big drain. I've wanted to do that big drain ever since we started going to the Great Lakes. I was really scared to do it because the competitors would use it against you. What, well, why? yeah, they got to have big drain because they stuff them all the time, you know? We stuff almost none. You know that, man. If you yeah. stuff one, it, you stuffed it. it. No, it was. I'm saying it was on me 100%. Yeah, you stuffed it if you stuff one of ours. You just don't stuff a bass cat boat. Yeah. And uh, I, the problem the was I was running a three that, blade that and five footers. Hole, but like the old Lynx hole, the new STS series, the Caracal. Yeah. You know, those holes there, the, the Puma being in that range, but not as deep as the other ones. So you can stuff more because it's not as deep. Mm-hmm. But the same true for the Cougar and the Era. If you, you know, if you stuff one of one of those. You asked for it. And I didn't want to put those big drains in years ago because I was scared somebody would use it against us as a sales tool. And what it really is, is a sales tool. Because when you do get water in that cockpit, and if you run those Great Lakes, you will sometimes, and you'll have it mm-hmm. up to your hip. I've seen I've seen guys out there. I came by one at Santee bailing water this year. Wow. He's gone through them, and he had to pull over and bail water. And one one ours. 
but I mean, I've seen them stacked up the mouth of Beach Basin where there'd be four boats talk, talking to each other because they're all pumping water out. Yeah. And, and I mean, I wanted that boat to take that drain and suck it in the bilge or the bilge is designed where it's narrow. So majority of water's in the pumps. We've got those 2000 gallon per hour pumps. They're both auto. They'll click it out of there. It was less than five minutes and I was back up on pad at 14 miles an hour. Like it was, it was, imp- listen, Ryan, I know you don't have, I understand it. He said, if you stuff a wave, it's 90% on the driver. I'm with you. And Frank was like, Hey, you need to get one of these five blades from Hydromotive. And I went and stuck with the three blade. So I was, I didn't have the power and the agility. Listen, I understand it was a hundred percent on me. I was just saying that I was in it and I was impressed at how fast it drained. Two things you can do on big water two things one is and this is what i like better than most and you most people don't understand this because you're running different you need to go down an inch or two a propeller i prefer going down an inch propeller or two inches propeller because it gives you three blade performance it gives you the mid-range lift and everything you need to carry the boat the same is true if you go to a four blade okay yeah, so those are the two things. Now, Hydromotive five blade, you know, it's it got its own mark there. That's yeah, Frank's rough water prop. Yeah, I know. I, I he, think you lose a, just a tad high end there, Rick, though, don't yeah, you? Sorry to hear about the sun passing away. I hated that with Hydromotive. I know. That was a bad deal. That's a bad deal. Good company. Good people. Dad, I hope he does well. I hope he continues to get something to go in because I know he was mm-hmm. kind of looking forward to an exit. Um that's probably not going to happen now. So hopefully he keeps his pattern together and they find some way to keep that company rolling on a uh, good, definitely reputable company in the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you talked about boat companies knowing each other. This is something since I've been going to ICAST, man. Um, you know, the bait company and boat companies never really, they're tighter now than they ever were. But you go back to that 1990s and 2000 era, we didn't know each other. Those are two totally different industries, you know? Really? Huh. Uh, you'd think yeah. it'd be smaller so you no, would know each other were, better. There were more of them and you just didn't know everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, Bill Liz and Smith Wick and all them, but you didn't, yeah, I knew Cotton Cordell and, you know, knew Bill Norman. You know, you didn't have to know some of those guys. And yeah. Bill Norman was, you know, Bill Norman drove a red Porsche. I did not know that. <laughs> I did not know that Bill Norman. Drove a red Porsche. It was pretty cool. 80s Bill Norman driving a red Porsche, you know. That uh that's a good transition. Let's take a break and when we come back, we'll kind of transition to iCast. You were there, right? Oh yeah, I made it down for one. Uh was gonna be there one, wound up two because of flights. Yeah. No, I I did not go. I was catching small mouth. You actually texted me and I said, uh Oh no, you I were said, up there. Rick, I've I said, Rick, I'm catching small bath. <laughs> you said, we'll have at it. So we'll talk about kind of what you thought about, about uh, that. You were up north. I was. We'll talk about what you thought about ICAST and stuff when we come back. Rick Pierce from Bass Cat Boats. It's BTL on a Tuesday, July 30th. We'll be back right after this. Yes. Yeah. Fishing isn't just a hobby. It's an obsession. Whether it's blazing hot or bitterly cold, bright sunshine, raining or even snowing. Someplace, somewhere, there's a fish that's ready to bite. And as the angler, you need baits that will catch the fish anywhere, anytime, no matter the conditions. From throwing top waters to cranking the depths, know the baits to throw. Choose Spro. Denali Fishing has me covered on the Bassmaster Opens. From their line of high-end rods, from the Android series all the way to the TAC series, the Novus series bait casting reels, all the way to the Covert series of tungsten in the cylindrical and the teardrop shapes. Denali has everything to keep me covered, whether I'm finesse fishing for smallmouth on the Great Lakes or flipping for largemouth in the slop down in Florida. The complete lineup is always on my deck and in my boxes. Denali fishing. Your early morning mentality is your every hour mentality. All gas, no brakes. Focus, purpose, power. Destined for the water, but confident everywhere else. A calming buzz before the storm, the truth of nature itself. 
can't catch lightning in a bottle. There's a limit out there, but it's not with your gear. Unrelenting power delivery. Unparalleled weight savings. Keeping you on the water, whether you run a 9-9 or out scoping your best fun. In this rare air, there's power in the silence. It's a mindset, thinking only of the things that matter and freeing your mind from the things that you trust. Get the best patterns back by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the deep dive app today. Look at that beast right there. All right, welcome back, BTL on a Tuesday, talking with Rick Pierce from Bass Cap Boats. Uh, iCast. I've not done an iCast show yet, so you're kind of going to be my uh, my eyes to iCast on what you thought. So you've probably seen a lot of iCast and a lot of new baits come down the market. Uh, did you have a chance to walk around? What was the vibe there? I know there were, uh, it was minnow heavy, minnow and jig head heavy from what I heard, Rick. Yeah, it's kind of the drill. I mean, everybody's going up to the FFS stuff, and we're seeing casting baits change dramatically. I think there's some, comp- some companies have done some really cool stuff. I, I know Pradco's done some good stuff with their line on their stick baits, and uh, there's definitely some stuff coming out. Dirt baits, I mean, that's the new word, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we call them stick baits, but everybody calls the Cinco a stick bait now. Yep. So, um there's definitely a lot of stuff coming. Uh, there's some new blade baits out there. A lot of, you know, a lot of uh, uh, high dollar glide baits, what we called a swim bait years ago, but now glide bait. Um, so everybody's got the new names as this generation has changed that. But, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff, a lot of rod technology. I think there's some really growth in the rod business that they're trying to get some upper end, some mid tier. I'm seeing a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think a, there's a trend away from some of the hypalon stuff, trying to go to some solid type handles, and a little trend away from the golf handle stuff. Um, I think that's probably good because they're heavy, you know. Mm-hmm. So no doubt, I think there's some things that are improving. A lot of a lot of real manufacturing. Everybody's in the real business there uh, now. I think there's a lot of room in the real business, but uh, you know everybody's in the real business. They're all made in China or Korea. A very few, you know, Abu's not made in Sweden anymore. Um, so it's changed. Um, there's uh, Rapala's done a good job with what they've done. You know, that's kind of came out. I mean, I looked through a lot of it, but I ran, I was in there for, I was only supposed to be an ICAST for half a day of show. And then I had to fly it out that afternoon and my flight got canceled. So um, now I flew the cheap seats in on Allegiant because it flies direct out of Fayetteville. And so, you know, one flight, you're home yep. that night. It was good. So I went to the weigh-in at um, the day before at the ITAC Cast Cup and saw that. That's a cool event. 44 or 43 boats raising money for Recreational Boat Fishing Foundation. That's okay. a good deal. Um, I'd like to see that grow. I'd like to see us have 100, 120 boats down there. So it's a big plan, you know, uh, no doubt. I think it'd be good. And MLF ran that event. And the, and Dave was out there, Washburn, and that was all good. Saw everybody. Uh, so I went out and visited. Um, the uh, saw a lot of our guys there. Saw Stephen Pellini from Bob's. He fished it. So Bob's machine. So a lot of people there. Got some cool things happening on that side. I think there's some mounting changes and some uh, plate changes type stuff that's happening in those industries. So we got new would, hardware coming out for all these. Would that companies. be a good guest, Rick? Pardon? Would, would that be a good guest? I've never done a jack. Guess. I've never done a jack plate show before. Oh, I don't know if there's a good guess in jack plate shows. I've got a. I'm kind of. I'm kind of cemented in my opinion. I think the most the best selling one is not the best one, you know. But I'm not going to go into that. You were saying Bob's. Like I have a Bob's jack plate on my boat. It's a great jack plate. Yeah, that's the same guy, right? Yeah, Steve Yeah, yeah. Would that be I a mean, good guess? He would love to show with you if you want to do a jack plate show, and he could talk about it a little bit. Um, Ken yeah. Smith and I had an interesting conversation. Everybody talking about jack plates from raising motors, and 
he went back and talked to Nick at Mercury and we had a conversation. Everybody wants to run these big offset jack plates. And he, he told Nick, Rick says that we need that thing tight to the boat. And Nick looked at him and said, he's right. So you get the cleanest water next to the boat because the further back we take the motor, the dirtier water is. Yes, you get leverage because your water's dirtier. So you're not as efficient. Dirtier as in more oxygen in the water, so less grab for the prop? Yeah. You only got about 10 inches of blade surface, man. Yeah. You got a five inch hub and 10 inches more of blade. So you take that radius and take the center out of it. Those blades are all that's holding your nose of your boat up. It is pretty crazy that that little thing powers that big boat 75 miles an hour. You bet it is. And lets you, I mean, you I know, know there's a lot of like, a lot. You yeah, want to I know there's everything. a lot of like hull design and all that too. But like when it comes down to it, it's like that little thing. When you turn, you make the micro adjustments. That's wild. If you think yeah, about it, the factor, you know, everybody wants to run them high mm -hmm. and run them back. And, and actually I told Chris Shelley this at Sea Star. we were working on jack plates and, you know, I got a patent with Sea Star on the pro tap. So pro tap, you hit this side, it trims up. Every time you touch it, it trims up and step, 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 step on the trim side. Every time you touch trim button, it moves a quarter inch. It's a really a cool part. We patented that product with Sea Star on one of the patents shares. Um, and every time you touch it, it goes up a quarter inch. You touch it twice, it goes to your preset setting. You hold it down, it goes to the top setting. So, I mean, it's a pretty cool part because it's smart. Mm -hmm. And it works really good. But I think there's a lot of need for something like that in the industry. That never really took off. Saltwater guys use it some. But I'd like to see that develop for more more than just that jack plate. I'd like to see you start to market that off to others. But I was talking to Chris Shelley when we were working on that project, and I had a four inch plate that we set up for it. And he's like, why did you go four inch? I said, it's cleaner. And we took that boat out um, and we ran it. And the thing was, I gained like a mile and a half an hour on a short plate. Hmm. It, it was quick. Yeah. I'd like to get Steve on after. You just can't hey. sell a four inch plate and everybody wants an eight or a nine yeah. or a 10 or a 12. Yeah. What's on but mine? Personally, my choice is four inch. What's on mine? Yours night. Okay. Uh, other eye cast observations, and then we'll get to yeah the current first eye cast. I didn't go to eye cast for a number of years. Yeah. But, uh, so first eye cast I went to, there weren't a tremendous amount of pros. They weren't working boots, but it's really changed now. I think there's probably more anglers there than there are buyers, and so I think the market's changed. I think they've changed. I think people are doing their own things with their buyers. Um, you know, you got to visit, I visited, met the guys at Pittman Creek. They were running around with Shaw one day. I met a lot of guys and I'm, really for us, it's more relational, but you know, there's, I think I guess got watered down by all the early releases of people trying to grab exposure before they get there to get people to look at the product. And so a lot of releases came out ahead of time. That's kind of the new media trend, you know? Uh, but I mean, visiting with folks was good. And that's what I always really do is just work with some of the relationships. Uh, you know, Jesse and Ryan at St. Crow, I didn't get to see Ryan. He was out of the booth, did see Jesse. Um, I, JP at working at Shimano booth. There's a lot of people that you know in the industry. I miss Cemetel. Cemetel runs a product out west. I like to say hi to him. You can kind of get them all in one spot. That's what my mm -hmm. goal is. Unfortunately, you weren't there. You were up north, which I meant to start this show saying congratulations to you on a great finish. Dude, I just needed that for my my soul, Rick. Like I've had a very uh, like stati like I have had a very average last year and a half. I mean, could not statistically get any more average. No, it's just been like this. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been just a little up and down. Yeah, but yeah, you go uh, you go like this and you do this. That's a problem. Yeah, that, but no, that was it was a fun. I mean, dude, I'm you know Champlain. Anybody who's bass fish for a long time, Champlain has a special place in their heart. And it was the first time that I'd actually fish a tournament up there. Yeah, uh, I tell you what, I was tickled. Awesome. I was tickled for Mark Burgess. Oh, dude, uh, former Elite Series angler. Two year Elite Series guy. Yeah, and uh, I I talked to some people who were friends with him and said, man, if there is one guy that we genuinely wanted to see win this event and it not be us, it was him. 
and you could tell how much it meant to him not the money or the trophy but the experience at the time of the life that he's in right now the way it went down overcoming the obstacles uh it was a it was really cool it's really cool every once in a while you see a win where you know it means so much more than just hey i won and got a trophy it was like yeah, they Mark, needed I don't that think win. he ever had a Bassmaster win. Mm-mm. I don't remember him having one, you know? Yeah. Uh, once I get back, I, I'm headed to Scotland here in a couple days, Rick. And once I get back from that, I uh, I plan on reaching out to him and getting him on the show. He's a good guy, man. No yeah. tickle for him. That's good. Yeah. You have, I mean, you've been to Champlain. No, actually, times. that's one you I've haven't? Only, um, only been on. I have not fished it. No way, dude. You got to go up there and fish, Rick. Yeah, I know everybody says that. A couple of guys I know up there, but you know, you know people all across the country. I just can't take all those days to go, man. No, just even just three days. Just get get it to where it's good. Fly up there, have someone pick you up and go spend a couple days cracking on them. Yeah. Man, I've fished over two hundred bodies of water all across the world. That's a lot. (laughs) Think about that. What's your top (laughs) five? Give me your top five across the world. Not just tournament, but like you get to spend one day on five fisheries. What five are you picking? Hmm. I don't know. I've ever thought about it like that. Rayburn's always there. Okay. Rayburn. Yeah. I can always remember everybody saying, well, I'm going to catch up at Rayburn. And I'd look at them and say, no, you're not. <laughs> everybody's going to have 38 pounds at Rayburn. <laughs> um, Rayburn's always there. You know, Gunnersville's a good one. Um, you know, my favorite fishery, my wife and I like to go. Matter of fact, we looked at pictures last night from Sturgeon Bay. Okay, so that's one that I've never fished. Yeah, Sturgeon Bay is really an awesome place. Take your girlfriend up there, Matt. She'll love it. You, you'll, okay. you'll enjoy it. Uh, it's a great place to go. I like Door County. Uh, we kind of make a recreational trip out of it. My wife pulled up a picture to show me her two six and a halfs last night. Okay, um, so it's like uh, I, they had a bass postseason and then some npfls there i think yeah, it's i don't know if npfl i think they did go up there but i mean it's really good and then you know i did toyota there one year of course they you got can the, figure them out like the, just you know they got the open up there that starts the season okay so it is uh it's wisconsin sturgeon bay open yeah yeah okay that's yeah. the one to look at sturgeon bay open man yeah Okay. Yeah. Now I know exactly what you're talking about. That's the one that is a freak show every single that's year. Right. Yep. Okay. I need to, that's on my to do list. Never have. You know, they got. Um, you want to fish got, it next year? No, I wanted to. No. Do yep. you want to fish it next year? I would like to. Let's fish it. Um, Okada wants me to go if I go. Oh, okay. so I don't know. Joe may be ahead of you on that list. <laughs> okay. I'll we'll find out though, okay? But that'd be cool. Okay. We could go, but I'm I'm not gonna bail on a guy that says, "Hey, if you ever do, I want to go." No, but, no, I've I'm a hundred I a hundred percent understand that. But I've got a cool deal, man. I mean, it's that's like a, that too. A really good deal. And, so there's um, three: Sturgeon Bay, Gunnersville, Rayburn. You got you know, two Ontario's more. Ontario's got to be one. Yeah. Going out of going out of French Creek and running out to Fox Island. You know, years ago we'd, we'd go to. <clears throat> out to blind island out there and um off the side of stony and it'd be joe thomas and robert tucker and me is about the three guys you'd see out there you know and then gps come along the first year we had gps i think i had 36 boats out there with me okay yeah there's fox right there that's so this is the whole area there and you've got, got a little area right that there big see? giant island and then there's yeah, you gotta go on out. This is one we went to. Go on out. That's it. Out here? Nope. The next one. No. Nope. Oh, that's over the Canada side, bub. Blow that baby up. Nope. No. Go back to the one on on the border. <laughs> right Pull there. It right there in the middle. There. Yeah. That's the ducks, isn't it? Yeah, ducks. That's it. That's Same wild. Duck Island. That's right. Yep. So I was planning on going yeah, out Blind there. Blind Island's head. You don't see Blind Island. I can't point uh-huh. at it, but it's in between Reeds Bay and the island. Dude, that stuff looks close. It's not close. No, no. It's a long way out there. You see the horizon. So uh, when you I was know, out we there. We went out there one year, and Roland came out there, and Roland went out there with like a six-foot trolling motor shaft, and it was like three-footers <laughs> in that little cut between the two islands. Yeah. 
and he is going up and down fishing a spoon on a smallmouth because he has a six foot shaft, he can do it. And but there were probably 20 boats inside of us that day. Wow. So when I was up there last, or do I have what, two weeks, three weeks ago now, Rick, uh, Travis Manson from Smallmouth Crusher, I buddies with, yeah. he's got a Lund and he's obsessed with down rigging for silver or for king salmon, Chinooks, and Lakers, lake trout. So you so went over we there like, in the bay and did it over in the bay. No, no, I wish we had. So we ended up taking out a somewhere over here. Anyway, we ended yeah. up like out yonder <laughs> in, uh, in an aluminum. Like it was a 35, 40 minute run in it. And uh, we never saw another boat and we're in like a 21 foot aluminum. Just, I mean, trolling for these things but i got my personal best laker but that was like the first time i'd been out like in the lake ontario proper like the big lake dude oh, yeah. that thing is huge man i mean massive so pull right over there to richard or whatever the name of that area is see that little bay right there North i think that would be pull blow that up right below there yeah we'll pull it up some so there's one over there, a sandy bay or something like that, right in that area. Yeah, I've it heard may that. be on up. It's in that range. So that was actually Biffle's starting point years ago, and it may be on down. Okay. No, it's not there. It's going on further out. Yeah, like, but right in out. that range, and it could even be further over. There's a little place I believe it's called Sandy Bay. Okay. And that was the place where Biffle would start years ago. Every derby. That's just one of his places, yeah. Huh. I mean, it's unbelievable he would make that run. And, I mean, I know a couple of guys that got pretty beat up on that run. I'll just leave it at that because they pay for it to this day. Really? Mm-hmm. Back stuff. You got it. Yeah, it's hard on them. You know, you've got a lot of guys that tore up their backs on those runs because they're just brutal. Yeah. And so, anyway... No, okay, stuff. so I got a there's for you, big boy. One second, that's only four, Rick. Oh, that's it. You got you got one more. Uh oh. You know, I've always loved Dardanelle. I just like to fish Dardanelle. It's a changing environment. I don't think it's as good as it was once upon a time, but I love Dardanelle. So I don't know that a fourth one exists. Um, Grand one. Lake comes to mind. I like fishing Grand. Yeah. LOZ's got a special place in my heart, but. Yep. All those places are changing, Matt, just like K Lake. Yep. Um, they're all changing. So the environment's changing. Um, I think one of my favorites that I haven't fished I'd like to go to is um, the one just below me over there, Mojave. Yeah, I haven't been to that. I want to, I want to fish. Uh, yeah, Mojave's one I'd like to spend a lot of time US on. Open a lot. Too. Know, but Lake Mead definitely is a special place. You don't catch a lot of fish at Mead and don't catch a lot of size at Mead. But it's got special. All right, trivia question. What was it? So, you know, years ago, um, you know Trey McKinney from Illinois. Yep. Um, you know Morgan Thaler, Cape yep. Illinois. Yep. So there's two other guys who want to turn from Illinois. And I'm going to go backwards on you now. I'm headed backwards, right? Okay. And I know of. There may be another, but I don't know of. That won a tournament. But there's two more I know of. You know them? That won a tournament or that? That won a tournament that were from the state of Illinois. Like what level tournament? Bassmaster. Did Doc Merkin ever win one? Nope. He did not win one. Uh, from the state of Illinois. I feel like I'm going to know. I'm going to feed you one. Tom Burns won out of the Alton Pool. I would not have gotten that one. Yeah, that was before Tom Burns. I would not have gotten that one. And uh, there's the guy that did it first was a guy that won on Seminole, Joe Burbeck, in 1969. I would not have gotten either of those, Rick. If I had gotten those, that would have been impressive as hell. That would have been impressive as hell. And you're usually pretty good. but it, And the reason I picked those, why did I pick those, Matt? Well, because I'm from Illinois. There you go. Decatur, Illinois, right in the middle. I was just there. just went to Joanne's uh, Mike's Tackle and saw Joanne, who's doing really well. Uh, one of the coolest little tackle shops in the country. Cool stuff. Yeah, you walk in and it's just like 
straight claustrophobic. It's just as high as you can see on the walls. And like, old I mean, stuff, everything. Stuff. Yeah, they just put the new stuff on top of the old stuff. So it's one of those <laughs> deals where like you might have like an OG wiggle wart behind nine new ones. It's getting a little picked over now, but it's still if you're ever within a two hour drive, it's well worth it. So there's four. Oh, what is that? Is that a wee wart? Oh no, that's a uh, that's an original rebel. The we are. That's a humpy. You got something on the back. Is. I don't know if I. I'm not going to open it. Yeah, I, don't open it. Bad, so I've got some just like this. There's the old rebel boat. Let's see if I got it right. Yep, rebel boat upside down on the. What do you mean they had the? They built. They took and put their boats on the back of the wrapper. That's how old that oh. is. Wow. It's a custom color. You had to buy 144 gross. Like a pink crawfish? It's purple, kind of. Everybody thinks Table Rock came up with a purple. No, you, it was before Table Rock. There it is. The, old, the purple stick baits they were making at Table Rock. Mm hmm. We get it right there. There you go. Perfect. The hump bat. Oh, yeah. There it goes. It just went. Yeah, that's like a, uh, yeah, like a hot pink a fire tiger. Too. Yep. There you go. The Rebel V165 Fastback. Now you're going to be. Yeah, that's an old M board. That's the one that was now. in the classic, big boy. Huh? Yeah, it was Kenny Baird did the work on some of that tooling. I dug these. We cleaned out dads. We sold all his tackles. So I got a couple of troke tokens here. I'm, I've sent them to some friends. Here's a here's one you won't see much of. I have no idea what that is. Now, it it's not more a sugar shed. Anybody from Florida probably can tell you. Yeah, I was going to say it's not a Bill Lewis. No, it's an Edmore Sugar Shed. Does that uh, thing sink? I had it's a Rogers here, but I sent it off to Jay at Midwest. It used to have Midwest Marine. I sent it to him. But I got a super. They called this a Super R, but what it is a big humpy. Okay. I've but seen that before. At the time, some of their, they spun off of what was a company called Rabble Rouser. I know. So they that. spun Rabble. off of Rabble Rouser and created their own type deal and made the first build bait and you had the screws that come off of them and you had to tweak the ring half a dozen times to get it to run straight cool deal though kind of like the old warts we had to twist them you know so, and have you seen what rabble rouser is now i don't even know what rabble rouser is now it's weird looking look at this i mean it's not <laughs> the same one but that's the same <laughs> Yeah, well, that was the this. rabble rouser. I mean, I don't, the company went out, so I don't know how they're around. But that's but... the that's the name, though, right? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah, same I, was look. Say. I mean, I'm sure it's the same takeoff of the company, but they had a crankbait, yeah. too. That's not it. No, I don't know what the heck that is. That's some Frankenstein-looking stuff. Yeah, that's a... Kind I of feel like, like that's got to be for... Lazy Eye type deal. Like that. It's out of Detroit, so it's got to be some sort of, like, so, um, and trolling deal. You wanted to do some stuff. You had a list here. So uh, you want to jump into what? I don't know. I mean, dude, we're already an hour, like an hour and a half 14, in here. Yeah. An hour and 14. Anything, anything you have a burning desire to chat about? I'm pretty happy. Well, I want to that. clear up a couple of things. Just, uh, All right. There's a lot of conversation going about uh, the industry right now. The industry is definitely normalized with what I call it. I think we're down to net levels of pre-COVID, a few years pre-COVID, you know. Uh, Mercury Marine had a layoff the other day, and there's been some hype on that. I've made public statement on that, but you know, Mercury's just Mercury. They they grabbed a lot of share during COVID. They created a, a lot of new product lines at the time. My friend um, Chris Drees was president of the company, and he made the decision to jump out and grab a lot of share. Um, and uh, they built the V12 platform for big boats. They built the V10 platform for big boats, which we do use also um it's a great motor v10 400r um the um v8 project came along it was all set up before in the early 2010s you know and by 2017 they offered that v8 v6 project it's in four stroke and during those times they added new product lines new people built it up they had tremendous demand and i think really where they're at they grabbed a lot of share so uh, that's normalized now. And when you go through COVID, their competition didn't have any, they had no 
no motors. You know, mm -hmm. Yamaha and Honda couldn't get any motors. Suzuki, they were limited. So all good companies, but they just couldn't get any motors. I mean, we got less than 12 Yamahas in a model year. Oh, wow. That's so uh, there's no way we could one a month. Every Yamaha customer, and we didn't get that. And here's a good one. Two of the motors we got from Yamaha were four years old, and we got them. <laughs> so I see what you're saying there. Yeah, so, I mean, they'd come out of the back of the warehouse somewhere. But uh, it was just a tough period. So Mercury did a lot of growth, took advantage of that. And the prop commit company has never caught up. They're still running hard. Uh, they're running over capacity and prop division. They added all new prop lines. They've got an injection prop now that, that for the big motors. So they've changed some prop lines. But Mercury's got a layoff going. They've had a couple of sharp backs. And really, there was a lot of false orders in the system. So that's kind of settled down. And Mercury will settle down. They'll get back to where they need to be. But the big motors are moving still. The 400, 500, 600 stuff. Uh, they're starting to see some effects in the big boats, the center console, 50-footers. But, you know, that stuff was all diesel years ago. So now they're going outboard. But that's a growth pattern they've had. Um, I don't know of anybody putting Mercury on a Mercury putting them on a credit hold unless their account probably needs to be looked at. Um, we're doing fine with Mercury. Yamaha availability is good. Motor companies have got prop, product now, so we're good. Uh, there is some stabilization in inventory in the field. The... New company, you know, Icon had a little growth, but I mean, they registered 55 boats in a year. So that's growth. But and they went from 49 to 55 on Q1 from Q4 of last year. And they've got a lot of inventories out there. So there's definitely going to have to be, I look for their numbers to come up during this yeah. because they've probably got more product than they're selling annually. So that's obviously going to show up in the marketplace. Uh, the White River Group and Ranger Nitro, they've got a lot of product in inventory, so they're definitely going to be in good shape to continue. What is that? Ranger, Nitro, Triton, Tracker? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to continue. They're going to have share, so they're they're going to have the products to support it. So the, the, everybody overproduces is going into a little downturn. What we mm -hmm. really have is normalization. You know, there was one period in COVID that I think that for an R12, I can't remember, but it is a stupid number that Nitro registered. I mean, it was like 4,400 boats in an R12, and it was a stupid number. I mean, they aren't building that many boats, but what happened is during COVID, if people bought whatever they could get, right. you know, it was a great time for Earl to come into the business because he grew. Well, but now he's on the other side of that, and he's got to find what normal is for Camus. Um, Phoenix is doing very well. We're doing well. Both of us are looking at single digit impacts. So we're not as bad off on a registration base. We do need our inventory to normalize. Um, they do as well. Um, not as bad as the others. We aren't, but definitely the two of us are probably hanging better than most of them. The, um, uh, look at the market. It's pretty solid right now. The last quarter estimate was down, but this quarter's estimate was supposed to be somewhere in the 2% up. Of course, a lot of that's incentivized. You know, we put programs in place. All the companies have got some form of program in place, but I think we're just seeking normal right now. And interest rates, you and I have talked about that. Everybody says, well, interest is high. Well, dude, pull a hundred year chart of interest. It is not high. It's high to you. But interest is not high to me. Mm -hmm. Matt, you froze up. No, you're no, there. You're I'm here. I'm reading and I'm reading comments to see what needs to uh, come up about here. I don't here. see those. You got them, Bubba. Yeah, Trent was asking. Now. He said the one thing you haven't mentioned is Falcon. Uh, Falcon actually fell back a little, but I didn't okay. mention them. <laughs> yeah. I I'm not trying to talk bad about companies, guys. Yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a deal. And then uh they had a really nice growth spur. The Falcon's basically gonna hang around the 120 to 155 range. Yeah. You know, that's kind of their zone. Steven and the guys are good guys. Steven's great people, they're good people. They I'm I'm I visit with them, you know. I went and visit them everywhere we're at, and we've set in some meetings together. Uh, they're good people. I didn't talk about them. Sorry about that. But <laughs> no, I just see. I mean, he just Trent and asked. Uh, I did 
I do think I found some nostalgia. I do think I found the original rabble rouser that you were talking you about. That's got to be them, too. doesn't it? Yeah, that's him. Dude, that looks kind of like a rebel we are. Like the same pattern on it. Now that's a little goofy, but like I totally <clears throat> see the looks more like a looks more like a Norman, dude. All right, Norman. Same those are deal, wild. Do you have any of those? I did have. I had some of those chartreuse and black ones, and they had some of those brown pattern ones with a crawl bottom, you know, orange bottom. And I don't know where they went. My dad's stuff, none of that showed up in my dad's stuff. And he may have gotten rid of it, given it away or whatever, but he had, he did have those. By Doug Parker. The lures with a teasing, tantalizing action. Pops, gurgles, rolls, darts, dives, and swims. Like it was a, it was a, so if you look at the uh, new Rabble Rouser, I think there is some similarities there. So I think think it's it's the same, same yeah, yeah. it's the same company that they, they've kind of rebranded. Yeah, I don't know the history of the company. I just remember it, you know. Interesting. Yeah, he had some old uh, Fred Young Big O's. Had yeah, a box of handmade Big O's. I don't think I've got any of those. You got here, Fred Young? Are... Every uh... time he'd go to something, Fred would hand him a, a Big O with his name signed on it. I do not have an ar- I have old big o's because it's my dad i think we talked about this before it's my dad's favorite lure like he when he went up to the boundary waters in the 70s that's what he trolled behind his canoe Mm -hmm. was a big o so i've got like i think the original like the plastic big o's like the old bigger plastic version before they were cotton cordell yeah and uh but i do not have like a og big o that takes uh, i think i have to uh, shell out a little yeah, we've got a box of balsas set aside. That there's a couple of big O's in it. He did have a lot of big O's. I don't know where they went, um, but he has handmade crankbaits from a lot of people in that one balsa box, you know. Hmm. I really enjoyed um, Ed Chambers because I've, I've got about half a dozen baits Ed would hand me that were handmade, not the wicks. I mean, you know, the, Ed would walk up, he'd have his hand out like this, say, there. Try that. <laughs> be a little whittled bait that he had that he had fashioned. Yeah, they were just different. I've got some of the flat sides he made. Cool stuff, man. Yeah. Uh what do you have coming up? Anything cool? Uh, you you have we have an uh we, we have an open meeting. coming up, right? Aren't you fishing another open? Are you fishing Hartwell? Uh Hartwell's the next one for me on the tour. Okay. So um I'm I'm just fishing that one division. A lot of people thought I was fishing them all. I was clear. I'm only fishing one division. I'm going to get my feet wet, see what goes. Uh, I'm fishing to win, as we talked about. Um, if you fish to win, you're your hero zero. I've been the zero. Um, but you're three days away from the hero. <laughs> so I got um, I got one more shot, and That'll be fun. You still get the adrenaline rush on that, Rick, even after all these years, like at the takeoff and stuff. Like, is it still, is it still like inside? You still got that burning desire at takeoff and during practice and when you're headed to the first spot. And yeah, I still got that. (laughs) That's badass that that never goes away, does it? The pump and go, man. Yeah. Yeah. I used to run the stereo. Dewey hated me. I'd run the stereo and jam it in the morning. I don't have a stereo in this one, I don't think. So no. Uh, a good question. You do you have uh, forward facing sonar on your on your vessel? You got two. You got two, and you've got a and you've got a three sixty in the back. I don't know if you're publicly saying that. Sorry, I should ask that before. Yeah, but you got I've a three sixty on, on your power pole. Yeah, uh, forward facing is. Um, you know, I can manage it. Um, I'm not as good as the kids are. My units are good. Um, I've had some trouble with clarity this year. Um, so I've had to update software several times and I've had to play with units. My clarity is probably not where it needs to be. My last boat was better on clarity. Um, but yeah, it's there. Huh. All right. Anything else? Uh, stuff coming up. Dealer meeting around the corner. Really didn't get on to do that, you know, but. How's your fantasy fishing game? 
Uh, I'm doing I'm doing very well in the Bassmaster. I had one bad event where I had like 800 points, and other than that, I was like in the like top 98, 99 percent. I do that deal with the Open Pros pickup with uh, Upshaw and Castledine, and I know that I'm better at Todd than fantasy fishing, but still, he just says stuff with such conviction that it sometimes has made me change my mind, and it's just been poor choices every single time. Bassmaster Legends Arkansas River Fantasy Fishing Leader. <laughs> I've got, got a hat. couple of those. We do this for our customers. Okay. And so you can jump on and play. It's Bass Cat Owners and Friends Group. And we okay, do a I'll have to join the group. The end of the year. And uh, we, lay, we logo every one of them with the, um, with the actual um, event. So they got them in on the back of them. Very nice. I brought that in for this conversation. So I said, I like it. Myself. Yeah, um, I love doing that show with Ish and uh, with Ish and Todd and Andrew. Yeah, that's good. You know, um, that's a nice deal. Really nice deal. I'm not doing so well this year. I got my wife playing, the kids playing. We got a, a family group, and uh, we uh, Dylan actually won two years ago on the um, Drain the Lake. My boy, the whole thing, like won an event or? And no, he won it all. Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, he won it all, and Is that like and, five uh, grand or something like that. Kind of funny because he had uh, he had Pierce on his deal, you know, and so um, they thought it was me, and it wasn't. It was my boy, and so uh, he's in his thirties, a little younger than you, and uh, he's uh, he's a uh, um, works in a therapy clinic, but uh, he um, had a good year, so yeah, he won the I would trip say so. Zona, you know, he didn't go, yeah. couldn't get free. That's but, cool. uh, he did win the trip. He got some cool, I, cool swag. I turned forty so this year, to, but we do it. And we're seed. I'm teed up. We I teed everything up to go into the last two events on the on the elite levels. I like it. Well, I'm gonna let you go. I got a lot of stuff to uh, to get ready for this trip, and then to uh, to tie end dude like the hardest thing for me is like a 28 day road trip i don't know how you do it with the running the business and as much as you travel and you fish and it just always seems like i'm chasing my tail when i'm That's back in I town quit fishing big boy <laughs> you can't spend it i mean i fished the elites one year or if it's when they were the top 100 yeah and, and yeah i mean you know i'd get in there dog tired i'd leave and drive straight home and spend a hundred hours straight working just to make it happen you know and you just yeah. can't, you can't do it man it's just you know you can but your focus is never and i did you know i did shows on the road uh i had like it was a really you know really cool experience there at champlain uh with the dude that i roomed with from canada and then i did some shows but uh i need to get the the system flawless right because you run into like the internet stuff and then you're like well why would i get off practice early but then my main income is be there's just a lot of moving parts on it on the road. It's an interesting dynamic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt. It's, it's a challenge. And for us running this business, you know, we got 70 some dealers and hundreds of customers we're directly engaged with. And then the, uh, staff you remember all of them, people. what they run, what boat they have, what color their boat is, what year they bought it, what dealer they bought it from. At that dealer's meeting, Rick, it was nuts. I'd never seen anything like it. Some dude, oh, there'd be, some dude would like walk up, and you'd be like, "Hey, Jim, how's the '98 Pantera in you know in the blue flake? You still running that blah 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 on it?" And it was just, I mean, you remember their names and the boats that they had, and you know, some were 2024, brand new off the showroom floor, and some were from the 1980s. And everywhere in between, you remember the model numbers, everything of almost every customer, almost everybody at that dealer's at that uh, at that uh, owner's tournament. It was Give nuts. me one story, Matt. What's that? Give me one story. From what? All right, I'm gonna give you one. Give okay. me one more story. Okay. I learned all that. My mom was good at it, but mom was we would challenge each other, and so that's a different game, but. Um, really, I learned the value of a man's name through a friend of mine that died of cancer about eight years ago. He, he died a bachelor, believe it or not. And we called him Catfish. 
is Carl Harberson. He played for a little school down in Arkansas Tech. And uh, he got drafted by the Jets and spent two weeks of training camp, decided he didn't walk with rhythm. And so he came back. He was he was a middle linebacker, defensive linebacker. And uh, Catfish and I growing up, he was from Malvern, and he moved to Mountain Home. His dad was Assembly God Preacher. And he started a, bought a little gas station on the end of a shopping center. I've told this story several times, but I've never told it publicly. Carl had a th- one of the ring binders like you had for class, and he would had 10 names, on, 10 lines on it, 10 lines, 10 lines. Matt Pangrak would show up at this little two-pump self-serve station. Carl would run out, and he would pump Matt's gas. He would meet you. Mr. Mr. Pangrak, I'm Carl Harbison. I own this place. I appreciate you coming in. And so on it goes, and he would write your name down on that pad. If he was busy, he would write your name down, your car, who you were. And next week, you thought, man, that guy just pumped my gas at a self-serve. And so the next time you get ready to go, you would go in and he would come back. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Pangrak, thank you for coming in. Yeah. Let me let me go on your windshield. Yeah. It, you know, do I need to check your oil? Whatever I need to do, you know. So Carl was we were all single and young then in our 20s. And Carl bought a Cadillac and a house. Out of a two pump self-serve gas station. Uh, Pretty soon he had the candy and food in there. Pretty soon he added windshield wipers and anything else he could sell to you for your car while you were there. And I learned from Carl that every time that a person knew his, he knew their name, it became extremely important to him. And I learned then, and this goes back to my 80s story with dad and starting and finding our why. The one thing we've always had as a customer base with a 94% loyalty that they're the most important thing we have. I learned that from a guy we called Catfish that I can't tell you why we called him that. (laughs) That was an ex-college football player that probably half of people my age in Arkansas know that died of cancer about eight years ago and I miss him dearly. It's a good story, Rick. That is a good story. Uh, what is it? Yeah, I'll catch you on before the end of the year again. Yeah, I saw one pop up. I flipped over on the comments. There was a question about values. And I don't think things are going to come down. There's Everybody's going to have to do something lower the inventory. So we're all taking one on the chin. We're actually losing money on product, sell product in some cases. And so everybody's going through that. So prices are going to normalize more. And they may not freeze, but in my 50 years of building boats, I have never seen them go down. So yep. I saw one year that they went down a little bit on some companies, but, you know, we're going to see normal. That's what's going to happen. Maybe we get it back in order. You know, we can't put a tariff on China and expect a consumer not to pay for it. That's, uh, that's a little bit above my head, to be quite <laughs> honest. So I'll just, I'll just nod my head and say, yep. Yes, well, the, 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 they're not going to pay for it. <laughs> uh, all right, Rick. Thank you for the uh, for the hour and a half. Always enjoy it. Have a great day, big boy. See ya. All right. Bye-bye. That is the one and only Rick Pierce from Bass Cat Boats. I think we're ready to cue up the music. There it is. Uh, tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. Special... No, it's not a special time. Let me make sure I get this right. Tomorrow, I've been working all this stuff around. Okay, John Garrett on tomorrow. Elite Series winner, a dude who everybody just assumed was going to be on the Elite Series for the last five years. He's gone through the college program. He's won everything there is to wa- to win. He will be on uh, tomorrow morning to talk about bass fishing. Then Thursday with Uncle Frank. And then a killer week next week. We have Alec Morrison. I actually filmed that early this morning. The uh, Invitational Angler of the Year. You do not want to miss that interview. Uh, I thought the first time I interviewed Drew Gill, it's very much kind of like that. It's inside the mind of a 25-year-old 
who literally in his rookie season never finished lower than 22nd. He actually kind of goes on and laments about his poor 22nd place finish. He had four top tens on it, won the angler of the year, won the rookie of the year, $140,000. We got uh, another killer interview uh, and, and he really opened up in this skeet Reese on Tuesday talking about his induction into the Hall of Fame, his recent win on the James River. Uh, I actually still have this right here. We go through, I mean, like, dude, like the, the years from 2007 to 2010 for Skeet were absolutely astronomical, like 24 top 10s, four wins, a classic, an angler of the year. Should have had a couple more anglers of the year had it not been for Bass's weird uh, postseason event and Kevin got him in both of those. Uh <clears throat> And then uh, I don't even know who we have on that, but those two who I'm super excited about. But this has been another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live. John Garrett tomorrow, Rick Pierce, the man. Thank you today. We'll talk to everybody later. See ya.